This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Even though she met her untimely death, that woman could sure sing. And it puts me in another good mood. I've been in a pretty good mood my last few monologues. I mean, I'm always in a good mood. Sometimes I might sound a little rough around the edges. That song kind of calms me down. An interesting week of history. For those of you that are not aware, the president of the United States has been in Asia most recently. A tour down to Vietnam and up to Japan. He might be going somewhere else too, I'm not sure. Well, I happen to be in Vietnam right now, and I happen to have been in Vietnam when the president swung through. I actually also happen to have been in the location, the physical location, where President Obama stayed for one night. Quite an interesting process, quite an interesting process to see up close and personal. And I actually have the video and the pictures to prove it. But I was fascinated to watch the whole process of his entourage, the setup, all the people involved at the military. Boy, there is a serious amount of military on the ground that you never, ever see just by watching the tube. But when you have a chance to watch, for example, and I did this, to watch and film for nearly three hours, the setup of his motorcade, what goes into all of those cars, who's in all of those cars, well, let me just give you a quick rundown. It's basically a small army of either special ops or SEALs, and it looks like they could call for backup and have an even larger army on site pretty damn quick. And I have to say... My feeling, being in Saigon, Vietnam, to see President Obama normalize relations, fully normalize relations, and people could argue why that happened, but to see President Obama fully normalize relations for the first time in decades, pretty damn good feeling on the street. And let me tell you why. The biggest reason why, the reaction of the Vietnamese people. For those of you, any of you that have ever been in Saigon, the distance between the airport and downtown, I don't know, 10 miles, can often take maybe an hour to get there because of traffic to get from the airport to get to downtown can take an hour. But if you've got a presidential motorcade, it probably takes 10 minutes. It's pretty damn quick. This entire stretch was lined both sides of the street with Vietnamese cheering for the president of the United States. Look. Some of you might love Obama. Some of you might hate Obama. I really don't care. But as an American, to be in a foreign country and see the president of the United States arrive and to see such a reception, that's just really freaking cool. A great feeling. And I spent some of the time out on the street amongst the crowd just to feel it. So excited. The people were so excited. They weren't going to get a chance to meet him. They might not have even seen him. They just wanted a glimpse of the motorcade driving by. Now think about that. All these young people, and this is a population of nearly 45 million people under the age of 30, half the country under the age of 30. A communist government. Now think what you might about the communist governments out there around this world. But I will have to say, whatever they call communism in Asia, to me, looks pretty capitalistic. I've said this many times in this podcast. But to see all these young people so damn excited, so energized, and to think about where America sits right now, which is heavily divided, it's very hard for people to have an American feeling anymore. Even the things like Memorial Day and the 4th of July are basically fake, I mean, for all intents and purposes, no one really feels this American vibe anymore. Maybe we get together and we celebrate with friends and family, but it's not really a patriotic type thing anymore. But what I saw on the street here with the president of the United States driving through Saigon, Vietnam, was patriotic almost. It was just a fantastic feeling. 
I wrote about a few of these things on my Facebook. One guy said, what a waste of taxpayer money. I posted a video of his motorcade exiting this area where I was at. I kind of had this great aerial view. I'm sure I saw some things that I was not supposed to see, and I'm probably not going to talk about them here. I probably saw some um, mm, uh, Secret Service craft that uh, maybe I'm not supposed to see. But then again, given to where I was, I have to assume that my background check was done. Even though I did not know he was going to be where he ended up staying, I have to assume now that my background check was done, no doubt. Not that I'm anything special, but given my proximity and the access that I had, there's no way in hell I wasn't checked out. And since the United States government already has my biometrics, my fingerprints, and they probably have pictures of my intestines or internal organs on file somewhere, I think I was vetted. I will have to say, when he was pulling in to this location, I did look up from my, my aerial view perch, and I did notice uh, Mr. Sniper uh, trained on me. I don't think he perceived me as a threat, but I didn't really want to take his picture either, and then he kind of quickly uh, moved behind some kind of a uh, building a facade where I couldn't see him. A little bit of an interesting feeling because, you know, at that moment in time, you, you say to yourself, wow, okay, if somebody wanted to cause the president of the United States harm, I'm now officially in harm's way because if the cruise missile came in trying to hit him, well, there's a very good chance that my proximity could have hit me. And you do kind of have that feeling where you see that much on the ground military power, much of it hidden, but a lot of it not. And when you realize, basically, the leader of the free world is within 100 meters or less of your location, okay, <laughs> I'm a target too. So if anybody's going to go out or if the president's going to go out, uh, th there's the possibility of uh, you know, kind of a tangential uh, destruction, and that would include me. So an interesting feeling. I'm not sure if I'm even describing it. But I did find odd also the, the individual on my Facebook that talked about what a waste of taxpayer money. And I don't think it's a waste of taxpayer money. It's not a waste of taxpayer money for the president of the United States to go to a foreign country and visit. That is diplomacy. You have to do that. And if the president of the United States is going to travel, whether it is a Republican or a Democrat, he needs security. He needs a staff. It ain't free. So we can say it's a waste of taxpayer money, and then we can all just lock inside our borders and not go anywhere. So some of you out there might hate Obama, and some of you might love Obama. But for those of you that hate Obama, don't just say we shouldn't send the president of the United States abroad for diplomatic visits. That doesn't make any sense. Don't let your hatred of the man that is currently occupying the presidency blind you to what the job of the president of the United States of America is. And diplomacy is a big part of it. I want to add also that relations with Vietnam are fully normalized. This is one of the great wars for America, the Vietnam War. A lot of strife, a lot of struggle. 58,000 Americans dead, as the Vietnamese call it, the American War. They lost 5 million. For a country that was destroyed, I think 20% of Vietnam can still not be used because our ordinance pollutes the ground, unexploded ordinance, 20% of a country. And of course, Agent Orange killed much of their old growth forest, which will never be used again. Look, that's war. It's a dirty, messy, messy, messy thing. But Obama deserves credit for normalizing relations. He normalized the relations. I'm not somebody that shares, and you're going to find that out in a few minutes when I go where I want to go with the main thrust of this podcast. I'm not someone that shares this collectivist, government-controlled, even socialistic mindset. And I know a lot of that is Obama's mindset. But he did normalize relations with Vietnam, and you have to give the man credit for doing that. Somebody noted to me after I said that Obama deserved credit, they said, well, why does he deserve credit? And my response is really simple. Bush was president for eight years. It wasn't normalized under Bush. Like, let's stay factual on this, people. Obama normalized relations with Vietnam. That's a big deal. 
a big geopolitical deal, a big trading deal. Again, you can argue for the reasons why it was done, but it was done. It was done under Obama. He deserves credit, even if I don't like many of his policies. I want to make one final comment about this. All those people cheering, there maybe was over 100,000 people on the street cheering. This is cheering on the president of the United States, the country that killed 5 million of their people. Can you ever imagine a situation where Americans would be on the street cheering for the leader of the country that killed 5 million Americans in America? Can you imagine that happening? Well, I was thinking England, the king back in the day, you know, there was quite a, quite a war there fighting to gain American independence. And now if they send the Queen of England to America, people will line the streets to try and see the queen. I guess that's kind of similar, but not really. Five million people killed. And look, this is no great pro-Vietnam, pro-America, pro-anything. I'm just trying to say it was one of the best feelings I've ever had to be on the street, to see the presidential motorcade arrive, to see all these people cheering in a foreign country, considering how hard it is to find patriotism and optimism anywhere. Damn nice. Damn nice. I really enjoyed it. I'm glad I had that experience. I probably won't have it again. And for all of you security, law enforcement types out there, uh, we'll have to have lunch or dinner one day because I definitely saw some things that uh, I was probably not supposed to see from my vantage, but it was thoroughly entertaining and interesting as hell to watch the nearly three-hour prep to get the presidential motorcade moving onto its next stop. Really, really cool. So after I offer all that praise, though, I do want to poke on some of the policy thinking that I really don't care for. Even someone like President Obama has some of these policies that I don't care for. And what I'm talking about are these more socialistic type policies. Because look, at the end of the day, what I'm about to present during this podcast doesn't make a hill of beans difference for you if you're trading or investing. Because look, we're trend following traders follow the trend. That's the name of the game. Follow the trend. What Mike Covell has to say has nothing to do with how you will trade at any given point in time. My opinion is zilch. But you know what? We need free markets. We need markets. We need the idea of price discovery. What we don't need is overwhelming government control. Because if the free market system and look, we can go back and we can look at 2008 and we can look at all the QE policies and the negative interest rate policies and the zero interest rate policies. And we could say, you know what? This really sucks. These aren't free markets. But guess what? Even non-free markets trend. And if there's still liquidity, you can trade them. So complain as you might for how the Federal Reserve has engineered the U.S. stock market since March of 2009. Who cares? It was very tradable, and there has been a lot of money to be made. But there are some extreme instances where governments can go way too far, and that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about an instance where, and look, we have one presidential candidate right now running as an avowed socialist. And I like many things that Bernie Sanders has to say about Wall Street. There never should have been bailouts on Wall Street. Now, I sure as hell hope that Sanders doesn't think the option was to nationalize these banks. But I really detested the bailouts. I detested the idea of that intervention. But it goes even farther than Sanders and his socialistic views. Right now in this world, we have a fantastic example of socialism run amok. And I'm talking Venezuela. Essentially, a failed state. An absolute failed state. And this was not a failed state. I can think back to about 15 years ago. I had several Venezuelan friends. And they had all left Venezuela. Their families, they had all left. They saw all of this nonsense coming. And they got out. But many Venezuelans today are suffering big time at the hands of a socialistic, monstrous system led by one thug named Chavez, and I guess the newest thug is Madero, I think is how you say it. I really don't care how you say it.
But here's what really unnerves me. We need markets. We don't need overwhelming socialism. The idea of being a trend-following trader with socialism everywhere probably dies. What I want to rip apart right now is an example. An example of an American. An American who I'm not going to say has lost his mind, but an American who I think is an evil person. Just evil. An evil son of a bitch. I'm talking about a guy that I was not aware of. I'm still not really aware of him too much, except for some of the article excerpts that I'm about to read. This guy's name is David Sirota. I don't know if that's exactly how you pronounce it. Again, I really don't care. S-I-R-O-T-A. He wrote an article three years ago in Salon, the online version of Salon. Maybe it's only online. I'm not sure. Titled, Hugo Chavez's Economic Miracle, the Venezuelan leader was often marginalized as a radical, but his brand of socialism achieved real economic gains. That's the title and the subtitle of this piece. Now, mind you, we have all seen the reports now in 2016, less than three years later, of Venezuela imploding. People can't eat. There is no medicine in the hospitals it's an absolute disaster. People are trying to escape. This happens to be a country with a massive, massive deposit of oil reserves, but they're so badly mismanaged. And the morons that run this country have just destroyed everything that now people can't eat. They can't buy medicine. They're fucking around with the time, literally trying to change the time so the working hours are different so they don't have to spend as much money. They've altered the work schedule. I believe they only have a two-day work week now. It's like they put the dumbest people you could possibly find in charge of a country with massive oil reserves and said, here, run. And of course, in short order, the whole thing's disintegrated. Getting back to this guy, Sirota, though, and this article, I want to read some of the things that he wrote in 2013. Again, I was not familiar with this guy. The reason I'm even going this direction right now, I guess, is partly because I, I posted this link. Maybe it was my sister that sent me this link. I posted this link on Twitter, and this little SOB, this little twit, blocked me. And I thought, well, what the hell is he blocking me about? I didn't say anything bad about him. I thought this was an interesting discussion. He thinks that Chavez, just three years ago, was freaking God incarnate. And today, Venezuela is in the toilet. So I thought it was worthy of discussion. Well, I guess if you happen to be the dumbass to write this article three years ago, I guess you'd probably want to block anybody that looks like they have an audience. Because how the hell do you have a career? Well, guess what? Right now, if you're a socialist in America, a lot of people want to vote for you. You do actually have a career, and this clown still has a radio show, apparently. Let me get into some of the specifics that he wrote about, though. It's just, just amazing shit. I want to read an excerpt. Chavez became the bugaboo of American politics because his full-throated advocacy of socialism and redistributionism at once represented a fundamental critique of neoliberal economics and also delivered some indisputably positive results. Indeed, as shown by some of the most significant indicators, Chavez racked up an economic record that a legacy-obsessed American president could only dream of achieving. This moron Sirota wrote this three years ago. Today, you can't buy food in Venezuela. Inflation is back at Germany levels during the wars. I mean, this is where we're at. Let me continue from Sirota. Again, this is three years ago. Think about how positive. I mean, this guy's just trying to find a way that he can sell socialism on America. And he goes to Hugo Chavez to do it. Continuing. For instance, according to data compiled by the UK Guardian newspaper, Chavez's first decade in office saw Venezuelan GDP more than double and both infant mortality and unemployment almost halved. Then there is a remarkable graph from the World Bank that shows that under Chavez's brand of socialism, poverty in Venezuela plummeted. The Guardian reports the extreme poverty fell from 23.4% in 1999 to 8.5% just a decade later. In all, that left the country with the third lowest poverty rate in Latin America 
Additionally, college enrollment has more than doubled, millions of people have access to health care for the first time, and the number of people eligible for public pensions have quadrupled. None of that applies today. All of that's gone. Absolutely all of that is gone. Continuing from Sirota, when a country goes socialist and it craters, it's laughed off as a harmless and forgettable cautionary tale about the perils of command economics. When, by contrast, a country goes socialist and its economy does what Venezuela's did, it is not perceived to be a laughing matter. And it's not so easy to write off or to ignore. It suddenly looks like a threat to corporate capitalism, especially when said country has valuable oil reserves that global powerhouses like the United States rely on. I am not about to sit here and pontificate and tell you that I like crony capitalism. And David Sirota and I might agree. I have a funny feeling, though, that if he doesn't like crony capitalism, he'd rather go to national policies and he would have every damn company in America nationalized, run by a bunch of flunkies in Washington, D.C. So we radically, radically disagree on that. Again, the reason I dig through this, there will be no trend following. There will be no trading. There will be nothing if little twits like this get their hands on the power levers. Sirota goes on to say, Likewise, in the United States, whose poverty rate is skyrocketing, are there any lessons to be learned from Venezuela's policies that so rapidly reduced poverty? He's asking this question three years ago. Today, Caracas, Venezuela is one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of lessons to be learned. Sirota continues, And in a United States that has become more unequal than many Latin American nations, are there any constructive lessons to be learned from Chavez's grand experiment with more aggressive redistribution? More aggressive redistribution. That means if you have money, twits like Sirota, policies that Bernie Sanders would put into place, they're just going to take it from you. I mean, look, the Federal Reserve is going to take it from you right now anyways. Zero interest rate policy, negative interest rate policy to come. These just take money from you, period. Zero interest rate because you can't beat inflation with zero interest rate. And negative interest rate, well, they're just telling you flat out, we're going to steal it from you every month. This guy, Sirota, concludes talking about the longtime caricature and marginalizing of Chavez But he says that's now dead. The cartoon will end. Maybe Chavez's easily ridiculed bombast can no longer be used to distract from Venezuela's record. And thus, a more constructive, honest, and critical economic conversation can finally begin. (laughs) Oh, I love this guy. What a freaking... Let me continue with some of his response. In 2016... May of 2016, Sirota goes on to quote the economic advances of Venezuela in 2013. He says, amazing 2013 chart about Venezuela's economy under Chavez, but oil reliance later hurt the country. He also goes on to say, here I noted the dangers of Venezuela's reliance on oil, that reliance now killing the economy. So the way that Sirota now defends his laughable, idiotic, and basically designed to be false commentary in 2013 is to say in 2016, oh, well, they relied on oil too much. And then things got mismanaged. So he uses the 2013 statistics in 2016 to justify it all. And then concludes Oh, well, you know, uh, they relied on oil too much, and that reliance hurt the country. And now it's all mismanaged, and it's all in the toilet, and it's all fallen apart. And I said, you know, back even three years ago, watch out for relying on oil too much. I'm not asking anybody to really care too much about this guy, Sirota. He's just an example, a tool for me to use to play with today on this podcast. I want to add to the conversation, though, because I read excerpts from his 2013 article. Let me talk about really where Venezuela is in 2016. And quoting from a UK paper, oil accounts for 98% of total exports and 59% of fiscal revenues. 
But apparently the price slide in oil, not the only problem. Quote, even under Chavez and $100 a barrel oil, debt was rapidly rising and there were already food shortages. This ultimately has to do with an interventionist model that is not sustainable and has reached a tipping point. The article goes on. Many Venezuelans have already left the country. Venezuela has taken good working companies, given them to the poor, but not equipped them with the skills to run them so they go bankrupt. The article goes on. The whole thing is a recipe for destroying a country. As I mentioned earlier, Caracas, Venezuela, one of the world's most dangerous cities. Today, Venezuela, one of the most unfriendly places to do business in the world, ranking 186 out of 189 countries and the World Bank's Doing Business Index. You might say to yourself, how did this guy Sirota get this so wrong three years ago? He didn't get it wrong. It was painfully obvious what was happening in Venezuela three years ago. It had not yet hit the tipping point, but it was painfully obvious. This guy Sirota doesn't care. These guys like Sirota have masturbatory fantasies about legions and legions of DC bureaucrats managing your life. That's what this little clown dreams about nonstop. That's what he's for. So he just ignored everything because he wanted to push socialism and his example was Venezuela. And for that split moment in time, boosted by oil money, he tried to make the case that there was something special going there. And he knew damn straight there was nothing special going there. Quoting from this article again, there is a saying in Venezuela, Venezuela is a country where criminals can really let their hair down. What the fuck kind of place is that? How can you as an American compose writing like that? Look in the mirror and pretend that you're real. You're not real. This 2016 article concludes, 10 years ago, I used to go to the beach with my father to camp overnight. Now it would be suicidal. I live in hope for change, but after living here all of my life, it's got to the point that if I leave, I'm never coming back. Trying to look at the geopolitical scene Trying to look at economics, it's complicated. I can be very honest and I can see something very positive with the president of the United States, someone whose political positions I probably don't share on many issues, but I can be very positive about something that he's doing that will actually benefit many Americans. Many of these trade deals will help Americans. Pure isolationism is not going to help Americans. Guess what? We import 100% of our shoes. There are not the skills or the manufacturing understanding to make these shoes. There's no army of Americans standing around saying, I will go to a factory and make shoes for a very, very, very small wage per hour. It doesn't exist. On the flip side, that doesn't mean there should be unfair policies towards Americans either. But my point is, Obama did something nice with Vietnam. However, when I break apart something like Sirota and his wonderful embrace of Hugo Chavez and Venezuelan socialism, his wet dream come true, I imagine this guy right now is in his mom's basement, dressed up like a small schoolboy, just saying, thank you, can I have another? No one writes that stuff three years ago because he actually believes it. He writes it because he has an agenda. That's all it is. That's all it ever is. As I've said throughout this podcast, these opinions are not designed to get you thinking only about trading. There is a right and a wrong way to go about life. There is a right and a wrong way for states to operate. I'm not saying America's perfect, but if we go the direction of Venezuela, f we know what's going to happen. And if all of a sudden around the world, pure socialism 
became the objective. It's an absolute death cult. There will be no trend following. There will be no markets. There will be sickos in government leadership positions that control everything. They'll control you. They'll control your money. They'll control everything. So look, I am a dyed-in-the-wool trend-following trader. The only thing I can do is put my bets on and make a trade. Have my stops. That's all I can do. I sure as hell can't control the many issues that I've talked about on today's show. But I feel very passionate that when I see wrongdoing, like this guy Sirota, like Venezuela, I'm going to call it out to the day I die. That's what I love to do. Nailing hypocrisy, nailing evil people. I'm not using evil in a religious sense, but evil in its purest sense. And getting back to the beginning of this conversation, that great feeling that I had on the street to watch all those young Vietnamese cheering on the president of the United States, that felt awesome. To read David Sirota's piece, praising Hugo Chavez, I need to take a shower. But this is our complicated world today. We can't turn off the politics. We can't turn off the macroeconomics. But we sure as hell don't want to try to trade on it. Stick to trend following for that. But you know what? I don't want to see people hurt. I don't want to see what's happening in Venezuela. And at some point in time, all of us need to stand up to the bad authority, to those authorities that we know are completely 100% wrong. And when you see them, to say nothing more to them than f authority. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money and up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.